As measured you may know, Camden is a self-supporting unit of the university, which is affiliated to the Department of Arts. And this presentation tonight has been made possible by a grant from the Anonymous Committee, and there are multiple such grants available. <coughs> Everyone at Camden Press, and of course the Art Department, is delighted to welcome Jose Lerma here this evening, who is the first Art Department alumnus to ever visit. Jose was born in Spain and grew up in Puerto Rico. He studied political science at Tulane University and went on to study law at the University of Wisconsin Madison. In Wisconsin, a few months shy of his graduation, he switched his major to art. He told me a delightful story the other day. It's actually paying off his law school loans by selling paintings. <laughs> I thought that was real sweet. <laughs> Subsequently, he, uh, when he graduated, he was granted a year-long residency in Puerto Rico and then returned to the United States to attend the Sloven School of Painting and Art at Tulane before going on to complete the core program that is affiliated with the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas. In his short career, Jose's work has been internationally recognized by his solo exhibitions, most recently took place at the Andrea Rosen Gallery <coughs> in New York, at Xavier Hopkins in Brussels, and at the Galleria Il Capricorno in Venice. We are thrilled that he is working with our master painters and all the graduate students at the art department at Camden Press, embarking on a whole new series of films. Please join me in welcoming him here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paula. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, you shouldn't pay your law school loans all at once. It's really, or anything like that. It's a bad idea. <laughs> um, um, anyway, um, I, 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 I'm going to start with this slide here. Um, this is from a period right before, um, I, I think I was at Advanced Painting, which is, some of you are familiar with this program. It's a really good, really, really good program here in the, in the, in the art school. And I, was, I had a little studio there, and I made these series of paintings of sort of, um, uh, sort of notorious people as children. And this is Nixon. Um, the, the reason why I'm starting with these is that, oddly enough, I'm finishing with, um, with uh, portraits as well. And I thought it would be a good... I could have picked any other slide. I start sometimes with some scribbly ones that remind me of uh, Twombly or something from earlier times. Um, I did Picasso at age seven. And I did Hitler at age three. Then I began to, something happened, I began to sort of question painting. <coughs> and uh, I was going in and out of it. At this point, I'm about to start grad school, and I began to sort of make prints of them. And that thing runs the whole gamut from left to right. I think it's Kissinger, Hitler, blah, blah. It goes all the way. I think the bottom right is Mao Zedong. And, you know, the thing was too loaded, too heavy. It wasn't subtle at all. I mean, there's something about it that felt very good at the time, but um, it was hammering too much a certain point about socialization and, you know, innocence and things that I'm not very sure about at all. So what the, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, then I painted, uh, yeah, this is a girlfriend I paint. Uh, the reason why I show this painting is because it does carry, like, a lot of the elements that I use in my painting today, the sort of goopy application of paint, um, this idea that I wanted to sort of paint paintings to be painterly, you know, that I thought that was the natural manifestation of the medium. Um, and um, even though it was a photographic depiction, then it quickly moved into this, this kind of um, very cartoonish. And this is my first year of grad school. Actually, the other painting was from a little bit later, but um, yeah, it's just chronological accident, doesn't mean anything. Um, at this point, is very, um, very influenced by George Kondo and certain painters, a lot of Augustine in there. But this is pretty much 
you know, my, my, the work that I ended up, I call it my mature work or something, because I jumped around so much. I was so unfocused in grad school. It was really fun. I made a second painting with using the same sort of technique. <coughs> then I stopped painting uh, for a while. And then going into my second year of grad school, I made almost no painting. And um, this, this will sort of become clear, but I, I started compiling this list of ideas, of art ideas, which eventually landed me my first residency. This is what I handed in to get into my first residency in Puerto Rico. Literally gave the guy a piece of paper with a bunch of ideas, and it totally worked. So you guys should try that. It's basically keep a record. Even the dumb ones are much better. And as it turned out, it completely applies to my practice today. Um, so I guess this is one of the pieces I did in, uh, in like my sophomore year, um, in which I, I was performing. I was doing a lot of work at that point. I'd, I'd sort of try to do one piece a day for about a period of six months. Some of them were more elaborate. Some of them were total junk. Um, and this is just uh, kind of a reference at Warhol's Silver Clouds. I had um, <coughs> yeah, a bunch of trash bags essentially during the second year show. A very annoying thing because there were other people's works in the exhibition and the trash bags completely kind of ruined things for everyone else. It was a really kind of not a nice thing to do. I didn't do it on purpose, but later I felt bad about it. Anyway, it looks really good in the photograph. And uh, what happened is that the trash bags began sort of exiting because there's a current that goes around the seventh floor and they would go into classrooms and magical, right? I mean, it's just more annoying than anything else. But and, um, and so I had people do um, sort of helium shots in front of a camera I'd set up and tell the story of their childhood, a happy story from their childhood with sort of the helium voice. And it was kind of beautiful, especially with the younger students who are sort of in that transition period. Anyway, at this, that means that I start working with another element. You know, you get the sort of the painterly painting and then this idea of memory, which, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very used sort of idea in art, but, you know, they're all individual, so I decided it was okay. Uh, again, with the memory, this is me trying to laugh and cry at the same time, which I would do in my studio, sort of set up a camera and spend a lot of time trying to get myself depressed enough to cry and then start laughing. Um, and <coughs> sort of catch it in the moment between one and the other one. There's a, Arnett Mick did a much better version of this, uh, Scandinavian artist, and so I stopped doing that stuff. But yeah, the memory thing, I'm, I'm showing a few of the pieces, but most of them dealt with memory. So um, this is uh, The World is Yours from a Scarface movie. I put this one in, um, Col in Collins Avenue in Miami. Um, it's, it's the moment when he arrives to America and sees this, sees this thing in the top of a building, so I liked it in a very kind of humble, and it also this is my introduction to sort of the sort of intervention practice that I got into as soon as I arrived in that, pre in that residency in Puerto Rico. <coughs> I also did, those are photographs of um, black, you know, black and white photographs of rainbows. That's not important. Um, Again, with the a sort of memory thing, uh, I, I asked my, I became interested in what would, what would my work look like if I, had, if I hadn't been socialized into a particular kind of art education. Not, not that I'm, I mean, I'm socialized anyway, but I want to know what would my ideas be like without art school. And so I asked my little sister and my niece to give me art, art ideas. So every year I would come back and sort of record their art ideas in, on tape. And as they grew older, their ideas predictably got less and less interesting. <laughs> you know, so it's sad. And also, there's my little niece. I think that one she stole from a book, which is a good practice. Kind of you know, start early. Um, these are boys that my little sister liked. She did the drawing, and I would do the painting over them. I, I mean, it's that same idea, sort of trying to get to something that would be you know, maybe, I, I don't, you know, why, why do you like what you like was a very basic question. And, you know, very present question. It still is, you know. I'm always sort of wary of, you know. 
Um, this is a show I organized in for this small this biennial they had in Puerto Rico. And so do I asked artists to submit their first adult work. So the first work they did maybe in grads in art school and undergrad or in it's usually the one that they're definitely not comfortable with. And um, so I asked all kinds of artists, some people that wouldn't get into the show and people that were angry that they didn't get into the show. They had access to the show by just donating that. So there'd be work by like Rick Richard Avanija, who's a very <coughs> prominent artist, who just gave me a, a description. Uh, and works by my mom in the same show. Um, this is a polished quarter that refers to my father. Um, now, not, not necessarily important to this lecture, except for the idea of memory again. It's a, if you polish a quarter from the 60s, it turns into a mirror, actually, it's silver. And so I picked one from the year he was born. Again, this thing is, uh, these are sort of Gordon Mata Clark interventions on this, uh, in Miami, where um, I was doing something, it's language based. This is sort of relating to the idea of Miami windows, which are those windows that you crank up in Puerto Rico. And this is my MFA show. Um, basically, um, <coughs> I was living in, I asked for the department to let me live in, well, I'm not gonna, maybe that's not a good thing to mention. <laughs> anyway, I, I wasn't here and, and um, I, 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 I came back with no, even though I've done work and I came back with no work with the idea of just doing the work on the spot and very much in a site specific way. And so I, I wanted to use the gallery itself and the history of the gallery. I felt that, you know, one of the most wonderful opportunities of being a student is that you get to make work about this place that you'll never have that opportunity to make work about again. It'll be gone by the time. <laughs> then you'll start thinking about stuff that you could do. So I wanted to do a piece about the gallery. And so for this one, I just, this is very simple, very kind of William Anastasi kind of logical sort of, you know, rip off the painting from, rip off the section of the wall and hang it back where it was if it, it was a painting. Then um, I did another one where I, this is in the same gallery, I had the back gallery. Um, I put a paint stripper on the wall and because the wall's been painted at least, you know, 200 times in a period of 15 years, you can pretty much create a negative painting by scraping off the layers. So that was the other one. It was a, a painting of just essentially, I don't know, the last 25 or 30 <coughs> students. And I like that sort of additive process. And I like sort of the sadness that these people are not around anymore and people could recall who did what when. And it, it sort of had something to do with the additive process of education. And that's what I liked about it, that there's a kind of topographical map that, em whoops, that emerges. This is the same piece, but done by sanding, which is a lot smoother. Um, and for these, I just ripped them off the wall, like I did before, and sanded them, them, sanded them to like a very, you know, fine, smooth finish. And here the topographic, what you see on the, on the right is the detail. You can see the topographical sort of how exact it is and it was really beautiful. There was some minute marks that I could have never made otherwise, but. Um, painted snow yellow in Chicago and then this stuff in the bottom is Photoshop, by the way, it's not real. But, um, <coughs> that's a sort of a version of expanded painting. This is me trying to creep back into painting, by the way, sort of resisting it and painting and trying to do a lot of work about painting, but not painting itself, you know. Um, this is a piece that I'm still interested in doing today. I mean, I've done it, but not quite the way. I, I came to this realization that there was a, a you know, a, a lot of installation happens to deal with um, bringing objects from the outside into the gallery. So I wanted to sort of short circuit that idea by building galleries around objects or around, you know, particular landscapes. So it would refer sort of directly to landsca landscape painting and this idea of framing. Um, um, I, I liked it because it was a very, very direct way and you would have later, whoops, this is one of the versions I did. I got these 
huge foam blocks that were the sort of experimental things that were used in architecture produced by this factory back home in Puerto Rico. And I began building the things. At first, sort of encasing these, what looked like could be potential art projects, a typical sort of grass installation in the gallery, that sort of thing. Um, maybe dealing with certain cliches of installation. But later on, I, be, I sort of came to terms of that, you know, I could just, I could just um, frame um, particular moments in my life, not necessarily for their aesthetics, but for, you know, for instance, I mean, uh, um, you know, the first place I kissed a girl when I was a little, you know, that kind of thing, that space carries a certain specificity and a certain weirdness, you know, once it's framed and sort of you pretend that you're in a gallery space, that you've never seen a show like that. And I became interested in that, that anyone, this sort of technique would be available to anyone. This idea of framing specific moments that are important to you would yield very, it's again a way of getting away from why you like what you like, you know, that sort of question. This <coughs> is a way of sort of entering through particular instances without getting too dramatic, you know. So, you know, there was something about, say, that hallway that was really weird. And it could be sort of directly transcribed. Oh, this is what it looked like from inside. Um, again, the same sort of idea. I, I took this, uh, my parents, they, they had a station wagon, they got divorced. My dad bought a Corvette. So I took a station wagon, uh, chopped it up, and put paper mache over it, and made a Corvette from memory, and <laughs> drove her around for the show. Then I did this piece where um, <coughs> in Puerto Rico, I mean, it, it was also about sort of taking advantage of certain sort of shortcomings and sort of social engineering. And uh, that was sort of the spirit behind the way that the work that was going on in Puerto Rico, certain things would sort of open up certain pieces. And I was, uh, you know, it floods there because they didn't design the roads very well. Um, so I would put, uh, yeah, put fountains and wherever it flooded in the road, so you get them in, um, you know, potholes and, you know, pretty much anywhere. And it was something for people to look at as they were driving, sort of very beautiful. Then um, this is a, this is a piece that I did. I, w I was asked, I was asked to do this thing in um, Miami Basel in one of those. They give you basically a a, a small space to do. Um, to do work, uh, a piece there, I, I forget the name of those things, but what I decided to do, again, dealing with that sort of specificity issue, was um, take uh, get the catalog from the, from the show, ask for a copy of it, which you got anyway for free, and um, apply acetone to the pages with a brush and remove, so loosen up the ink and then paint the walls. So you would get a kind of, a sort of a transcription and of the, um, a direct transcription, I guess, of, of, in a way, I guess, of the galleries, of every gallery that was there. So by visiting my booth, you could see the whole show in, in, in some sense. But I, I liked the way it looked, and I liked that idea a lot. I mean, the way in which, the idea of taking the book was really lame. I mean, it was just too, it was too logical and too kind of, you know. But I began to move away from that. Uh, but I did like the idea of sort of loosening the, the skin of something as a means of painting. Um, and so I had this show in Chicago in a small gallery there where I, they happened to have, on the right you see this thing as a cabinet, and I just applied uh, solvent, I guess acetone again, and loosened up the, the paint from the cabinet and then painted the wall, which you can barely see, it's very sort of liquid painting, but I like the way it kind of relates to the idea of a container that is a cabinet, and the rest of it being sort of watery, and the thing to be sort of put in a container. But what I liked about it, what I really liked about it, was that uh, for me it's sort of a, an extension of, essentially of still life, and how it related to painting, that I could, I could make a painting of an object by, by removing its outside skin, the part that you see, you know, that suddenly I'm left with, um, you know, suddenly the, the whole world became, you know, a painting, you know, a, so basically pigment minus sculpture or sculptural elements left me with a kind of flatness that was painting. 
and uh, it opened up a lot of ideas, you know, for, you know, making future paintings of transcriptions of objects. Um, and then I did this piece in Mexico City <coughs> where I, I had um, a car parked on the bottom left. There's a car. There's a sticker on the car, and the sticker is an emission control sticker to prevent smog, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and everyone has to get it there. The sticker, at a certain time of day, at, at noon, the thing, roughly, the light from the sun would bounce and go through the entrance of this exhibition space that was called Ex Teresa. It's a 17th century church, and the back of it is super modern and stuff. Um, and then it would reflect this thing that you see in the <coughs> left, in the top left. So you, I made a painting. You know, it was a really kind of beautiful painting, sort of prismatic painting done with no... I mean, I liked it because I did nothing. That was, to me, like a triumph. Like, I was like, okay. And, um, and then, you know, I was, I'd gone through all these permutations of sort of trying to deal with painting in a way and not painting. And then um, my, my girlfriend at the time sort of broke up with me and I got, you know, I became sort of insufferable and very pathetic. So I began to paint, <laughs> began to paint again as a means of sort of getting in contact with something. So I, the whole time when I was making the other works, they were always, I used to talk about, 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 about them as a kind of sort of the tension between the pathetic and the heroic. Um, but this time I really felt that way. It wasn't so. <laughs> so for about three weeks I had the opportunity to sort of put into practice all this junk I was talking for, for years. And, um, and so I stayed in that apartment, I stayed in an apartment in New York, sort of making these sort of paintings. <coughs> They were very much about how I felt. It's very simple. This is about 2000 and late 2002, uh, December of 2002. Um, mostly self-portraits. And then a funny thing happened. I, I um, you know, I left them there because they were wet. Went back to Puerto Rico, and then my my then ex, a friend of hers, came into the apartment and said, "Hey, you know, I could use these for a show." She had a small gallery in Brooklyn. And um, <coughs> she put me in the show with another person, and then I got this really good review in the New York Times about something that I was I just really embarrassed about this work. I didn't even consider it my main work. I mean, I was just, and uh, I was kind of took me by surprise because this whole time I was I spent sort of not making fun of painting, but sort of addressing it oblique, in, in an oblique way, you know, sort of not dealing with it. And it, as it turned out, I had been painting in the back of my studio, I built a fake wall so that people wouldn't give me a hard time in this residency, which was highly conceptual. And, and, uh, and so suddenly I was like, hey, you know, I, yeah, I can talk about painting. You know? <laughs> it was funny because at that point, it was, this happened as a kind of painting also was coming back into the floor. And I think like um, Dana Schutz's first show was happening at the same time. So it kind of opened up a certain kind of gestural painting again, which I guess that happened a little bit in the 90s with, with uh, Cecily Brown and a few people, but it really kind of kicked into high gear at that point. I noticed that suddenly it was like really cool to be a painter again, and I, and I was painting, you know, it was like, oh, you know, it's funny, you know, like all this time people saying this and that, you know, which will happen in your lifetimes like 200 times, by the way, so. Um, yeah, and the paintings were, again, autobiographical. You know, like a lot of the work I'd been doing before, um, I decided to sort of make the paintings, you know, deal with my life. I thought, well, I can't do paintings that, I mean, I could basically, one good thing about paintings is it allowed me to sort of access memories very directly, you know, and I thought, well, a camera can't do that very well. You know, I was always looking for these things that could be painted very well, you know better than with any other medium. I was looking for medium specificity, which was my obsession with other mediums. And so, you know, painterly was one thing, and now about my life, sort of memory was the other element. It had a kind of clarity. I finally, you know, for a long time, I was like, what the hell do I paint? So these are elements that kind of put them together. It was really easy to start painting after that. This is uh, my little kiss gang that I had when I was 10. 
another version of it. It's the leader, Alex, who was a total coward. You know, Slay was the leader. Um, yeah, what is, you know, basically at this point, most of the paintings became, it was almost automatic. A lot of self-portraits at the beginning, shifting into different kinds of work. These are details, very, very thick paint. And I was very attracted to this idea of kind of, of like, a kind of dumb virtu virtuosity. I mean, I've eliminated that from my work now, but at that point it seemed a very good way of sort of having passages that were very interesting with a straight face, you know. Like it's always like, how do I communicate something without going overboard, you know. This is another one, so you can see super gestural, but always they had some cartoonish element that sort of brought down the tone a bit. Um, here's a little painting that I like a lot, it's a Naked Snowman. Later on, I, you know, I began to, I mean, later on I began to move away from all, I mean, not yet, but you'll notice it gets less and less cartoonish as it goes along. This is a projected portrait of me as a professor later on. Mm -hmm. um, this is my band when I was 16, we were called Nada. <coughs> and we wore polo shirts. That was our big kind of thing. <laughs> we thought we were terrible. But I, I, I made a lot of paintings of this Nada group. I thought it was kind of cool. It was something to do and it gave me access to a kind of, you know, the band portrait. You know, that sort of four guys standing there looking like they're something. Mm -hmm. and, and then it got really homoerotic for some reason. I mean, it's just a little weird. I don't know what's going on in this one. <laughs> And this is a classic sort of, you know, band shot thing. I mean, maybe that's a kind of, you know, formalism that I, you know, maybe it has to do with um, old master paintings or something, the way, the way those things are sort of placed today. You see that a lot, you know, in the, you know, the, the band portraits. Um, these are sort of s studies. I do a lot of studies for my paintings. Mostly, um, you know, just very sharp pencils, and I don't know if you can tell, but another obsession of mine is sort of very minutely adjusted color shifts, and I want the painting to be very slow at once. So you can see on the white area, sort of very, very slow, what I call slow, slow paintings, you know, varying in sort of dimension and density, and then very graphic lines sort of next to it. I, I like that kind of shift, you know. Whoops. The guy that bought this painting hung it upside down. I think it was funny. Um, I became obsessed with a lot of, <coughs> I made a lot of shirt paintings, um, starting with the Sergio Tacchini shirt that John McEnroe used to wear, which I was obsessed with. I like the idea of painting shirts, you know, sort of a, a field, you know, kind of like a, like a field painting kind of thing. It was mostly because of the little polo guy that was running I felt like you could literally paint the whole thing and just have the little polo guy running through it. And it would feel like an open sort of expanse thing um, over some kind of man boob or something. Um, <laughs> so this word, that last one was just sort of site specific. Um, you know, and they got, again, these, at this point is sort of the height of the, the sort of the dumbness, you know where I'm trying to sort of do very, very stupid things and try to paint them in a very kind of, you know, flashy way. But, uh, yeah, it's shirts again. Um, same shirt, I mean, I, I really abuse this subject. This is a good one, though. This one refers more to the, like, sort of middle stage, sort of beef and corn, the sort of, you know, horizontal, watches of color and analogous sort of, you know, um, colors as well. Whoops. And this is a installation shot from when I got the first show in New York. It was in the back room. Um, 
this one. I mean, uh, it, th these things, I mean, th this, from, this is from a fall I had when I was a kid. I fell and I tore my, my chin or something. So it's kind of a frontal thing, but it's, so mostly I became sort of convinced that all these things were good enough to make art. You know, they were mine and they would yield a kind of idiosyncratic, um, in which was all I was interested in. I wasn't interested in whether it was good or not, including my influences, they would all be collapsed. You know, that was sort of my, my main kind of interest, you know. I, I also had a, I still have a belief that, <coughs> you know, that, that sort of, um, you know, um, I don't know, what's, what's the belief I have that I can't remember? <laughs> I'll remember it later. Anyway, <laughs> this is, um, yeah, this is another episode. Uh, it's from when they cut the sugar cane in Puerto Rico. It's sort of the, the charcoal gets, you know, everywhere. It looks like it's black snow. These little things sort of became the, 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 the emphasis for the, the, the starting point for the new series. It's very common, but you know, it was, it's common to everyone and very different. That's what I liked about it. Um, you know, anyway, I, I guess what I was trying to say is this thing that I always sort of start with and I didn't today, but it's, it's a, you know, I guess at some point uh, all art is about, um, you know, other art and your parents, you know, and these are things that I found sort of unavoidable and, and you know, in, in most forms of art. And what I did was to decide to sort of engage that sort of equation, you know, very, in a very frontal way, um, including stylistic influences and all like, it's sort of very methodical, like a little machine. So what you're seeing here are <coughs> how I produced the kind of the drawings um, and the backdrops to my paintings. I take all these moments from my life, whatever they are, you know, you can see next to my thumb is that this robot I had when I was a kid a toy robot, that kind of thing, my kids, everything that's in there, and I collapse them into acetate sheets and sort of collapse the whole thing into one sort of abstract painting, which, which is, I guess, what you're seeing in these things. You can see the, the Mazinga, the same thing that was there. And I like that idea that you can have all these biographical information in there. And it's biography is not important, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just important as, in what aesthetic way it points, what direction you let it point to, and that's the only reason why I was doing it. I wanted biography for its aesthetics, not for, because my life or anyone's life is interesting in any way, but it's not, I mean, it might be, but mine is. Anyway, <coughs> this is some school I went to that had a ridiculous name, so I made a shirt about it. So it looked pretty good. Um, again, this is how I use, I began also to add, access and explore my previous work, the sort of, the more kind of multi, you know, disciplinary work or whatever it was, um, like video and that kind of thing. And this is, uh, I mean, I did this real silly piece where I break dance naked with a bull's head, like a minotaur. And I did it for my birthday when I was 30. Um, <coughs> something about Picasso getting older and painting more minotaurs, something to do with vitality or something. But I like to break dance because I'm, I was good at it when I was 11 and I'm not good at it now. <laughs> and the video sort of showed, showed that. The main reason why I'm showing that is not because of the piece that was from way before, but because I began including all these dorky pieces I did into my painting, you know, sort of putting it in there. And it became very valid, you know, like everything you're doing today will somehow flatten out if you want it to, I mean, and yield sort of a, an idiosyncratic, you know, aesthetic and that's all, all I began to care about. It goes back to sort of the framing thing. Uh, for instance, this is the, uh, my f what I call my first drawing teacher, this clown on TV who drew for kids and he used to be a dentist in Mexico before he was a clown, Cepillin. So made himself exploding. And the paintings are very suggestive, meaning like I don't arrive at the idea of making this clown, it's simply I drew all these experiences and then they kind of start looking like something. And then the memory sort of kicks in and that sort of thing. This was the nest, nothing about it. I kind of run through these because they're more about looking. I 
mean, they got more and more elaborate. So this is the thing, the drawings just got, this is the messenger, messenger again, the robot that I had, but at this time it's sort of made up of hundreds of other drawings that I've made before. And that's sort of, I like that self-generating aspect of how it's sort of, you know, the thing is sort of a machine to create sort of a, a look, a style. I mean, I'm sort of a dirty word, but. And also when I was in grad school, I did a lot of pieces with, um, I shot a lot of elbows of famous people from like the internet and that kind of thing. I was kind of obsessed with that. Mostly as a sort of tool of social adva advancement, you know, that kind of. And I painted a lot of elbows later on. I thought, you know, that's an interesting. These are drawings that I made um, for this drawing, sh what is for this painting show I did um, in Puerto Rico a long time ago. I did this thing where what Francisco Ayer was the sort of foremost, he's the most important painter in the history of Puerto Rico. He's from the 19th century. And I found out there was a guy that had the same name in the phone book. So I did a t-shirt of his and I wore it for this opening. It really rained kind of, I mean, but, but then it was a great thing to draw later on when I became more of a, when I started drawing as a perfect subject, you know. And I'll go through some of the drawings sort of in quick succession here. Very, I mean, this is very Gaston-like. So it sort of was a problem at the beginning, trying to come to terms with that. Um, and, you know, this is again sort of, uh, of many, many collapsed drawings with the work Golden Sea, which was where I grew up, the name of the neighborhood where I grew up. And sort of everything that it evokes, I liked about it. I really like this drawing, this one in particular. And something about these drawings is they take me a long time, sometimes longer than the painting, which is, uh, you know, so much information in them. Like this one, for instance. They're, they're a much better deal, I think, so time, considering the time I spend on these things. <laughs> this again, the elbow. This is from the last show. Um, this time it's a, the, sort of the advancing elbow, but with a hippie tie-dye shirt. I like that kind of contradiction. And also began sort of formally playing off the edges. So you have the elbow playing a certain way and then the shaped canvas sort of playing the opposite for the tension of it. Or Maybe, I don't know, sort of high modernist sort of um, signifiers. Probably not. I mean, just, I like the way they look. These are details. Um, this is sort of, <coughs> you can see here like the gallery sort of in the back of it, the gallery that frames the thing and about a hundred pieces that I've done, including this Giacometti thing that I did in Houston. Where I, I locked my bicycle to the Giacometti sculpture outside. Um, after someone that something that someone wrote to me, it wasn't about Giacometti himself or anything, just wrote something about Giacometti. Anyway, it's a good subject to put in there and it's painted in a particular way. So you can see the texture, it really kind of feels like it. I got into trouble for that, for the locking thing. Um, and then, um, you know, you can see the shaped canvases holding the cabinets. I brought back the cabinet piece. So as part of sort of investigating my, sort of everything I've done, the cabinet had to come back. Um, and you can't see, but to the right of the cabinet, I <coughs> took the paint off and painted the wall with it. So it was sort of, you know, sort of expanded painting again, and sort of dealt, I get dealt with this time with sort of a wall installation, I guess. This one I like, because it formally refers to the cabinet you know, you got the three lines of the shirt on top and the, the shelves on the cabinet and the way the arm opens up, you know, with the door and all that. I mean, they're really tight. I'll just run through some of these. It's from my BMX stage. I like this one. So just details. Again, it's one of the drawings just done. Um, these are installation shots from the last show. And uh, more recently, I began doing these, what I call paint portraits. Um, and 
they just follow the, the cliches and the sort of formalities of portraiture. They're done in portrait, mostly portrait weave, but sort of soft portrait gray canvas and um, with a kind of verticality. And, and uh, they come from this, like, this line I read about, you know, just the cooning where they used to talk about oil being for painting flesh. Um, that basically I mimic, you know, like in the bottom you can see me trying to mimic sort of the weave of a canvas, it's very thick. But mostly it's just a paint, there's no, there's no likeness to these things. They just sort of feel like portraits. Not this one, so I screwed up with this one. <laughs> but you know, these are, this is kind of it. This is the last series, sort of blobby. And I really like doing, making these, they're a lot of fun. And um, I can stare at these things. You know. I'll just run through these really fast. So I know. They're not of anyone in particular. That's the other thing. People always ask me that. In fact, the paint sort of suggests the portrait. It's a group shot of them. And uh, that's it. That's the last bite. Yeah. Oh. Well, Jerry, we'll uh, um, take any questions. Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> yeah. So are you actually with the acetone and the acid, are you then using a brush to make the paint run to the wall? Mm -hmm. Or are you actually using the acid to put the paint? No, no, the brush. Sorry. The brush, because it doesn't loosen enough. But uh, I wanted the transcription to be more about painting than about sort of printmaking or pressure. I am very aware of these things, what is, like what is a drawing, what is a painting? Is pressure something that's particular to drawing? Is pigment something that's particular to painting? How do you break them down? I'm always thinking that what needs, what it needs to be. You know, so I thought it had to be more about, you know, the way you would paint, you would take off the outside skin and be left with something that philosophically maybe felt like the object. Yeah. I was I wasn't sure if I had one question. It was a question about if you were drawing on acetone or aluminum. Yeah. That the drawings on canvas are they're not separate layers, right? So when you say No, there there was there was there one single right. charcoal drawing that's so been you fixed. Know, like well, no, I mean, once you collect, like each acetone sheet has a different oh, drawing on them. Okay. Yeah, and I oh. just sort of put them there, project them, and okay. however it lands, usually I use it to sort of kick off a new direction. The one good thing is that the, so the gestalt of it, not the individual drawings, is what points into the next sort of, so, you know, that points into say, oh, that kind of looks like an elbow, and I did a lot of elbows, and then I start thinking about that. That's what I like about it, sort of self-generating. You know, I'm using the drawings less and less, though, in that in that regard. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I showed it. There's a slide at the beginning that I did this transcription of. I took the paint off a cabinet and painted the wall with it. It was a cabinet I found in the gallery. And so it's sort of a part of the sort of a biographical investigation. I thought I had to go back. Like what I wanted to do in the end was sort of have all of them inside a frame, the way I was framing the, the, the spaces with the, you know, with the gallery. I wanted the painting to sort of, in some way, sort of collapse things in the same manner, you know, in the hopes that a kind of a style would sort of, uh, you know, sort of idiosyncratic sort of language would emerge. You know, that was sort of the main idea. So I went back to the cabinet, sort of put it next to the painting. It looks very clunky, but it's, you know, the whole idea is that it had to be about me at some level, or sort of, it had to feel like me at some level, in some honest way, you know.
I'm making, um, well, you know, you saw the last set of portraits, the sort of portraits of paint thing, paint portraits, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm doing these sort of composite, uh, it's like hundreds and hundreds of these drawings, sort of creating maybe what would be the frame or the outline of the figure, maybe the hair or something like that. And then, uh, but essentially it's, it's based on the, uh, on the paint portrait, the sort of general idea of following a, a um, you know, the idea of a por of portraiture, but I like them because they're sort of indistinct and you can project a lot into a portrait that's so general. That's what I kind of liked about them. But at once they're about paint, but they're about a hundred people, you know, and um, that's the kind of portrait I was interested in. You know, I've been trying to paint with this mirror paint with the idea that maybe it would pick up flesh from the reflection, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> threw, threw away $300 on this mirror chrome thing. Don't ever buy that stuff. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, yeah? Uh, you talked about how your, your earlier work was really about people who were kind of like trained that way. Mm -hmm. By making the, the strict painting yeah. versus the other stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about that, that sort of stuff. I mean, but, you know, in, in a sense, conceptualism and modernist, the sort of modernist painting are not that far apart chronologically in the history of art. So I started thinking, like, whether one thing sort of felt like it was in some sense better or worse. And I, I decided to just sort of, in the grand scheme of things, it, it didn't quite matter. That's why I ended up sort of trying to collapse both of them. Sort of a very, very much sort of intuitive kind of painting with these pieces that in some way like made no sense. They look kind of goofy together. But uh, it's, it sort of shows my, maybe my indecision in the process of sort of arriving at something here. Like I want both of them to exist, you know, however timid the, the, uh, the, the, the expression is. I'm not, I'm not filling up a room with stuff. You know, I'm doing something within a kind of frame. So I'm trying to address that in the recent work, you know. Maybe that's why I kind of felt like I had to, like, like you know, like this is not me, I'm not. I mean, I came from painting through doubting painting in some sense, you know. Like I had to kind of get to it, you know. I had to sort of felt like I believed in it enough, you know. And it was a good way because I really like painting, you know. But I wanted to see how you know how it gets done in a certain way. <coughs> so, all right. So can I th ask yeah. Can you can you describe how uh, when you left here that you went on various residencies and how that helped your work? Oh yeah. Um, I I did. Uh, well, the first thing was uh, this residency in Puerto Rico where I handed in the thing. By the way, uh, any student here, they should make it like mandatory to apply to at least five residencies before you're done, <laughs> before you graduate, because it's like the most amazing opportunity. It shouldn't, you know, it makes a difference between like having to get a job and like, you know, staying in art, you know, if you want to know. Um, so I got this, I got lucked out into this one in Puerto Rico, which gave me the chance by handing in this thing, you know. This, it was funny, but uh, I just, I got there, gave him this thing. This woman said, hey, you want a studio? I was looking at that, I was like, what? You know? um, and the other ones I just applied. I mean, and the core has been, the core was really used, really sort of instrumental in sort of, you know, in, in Texas, in sort of setting me up to move back to New York and, you know, do the gallery thing because it was there that, you know, some of these places would showcase your work. Um, and that's kind of how it came about. It was there that they kind of saw my work and they asked me to do the shows. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was very, very helpful and you should all apply at least to five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Cool.